Thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, always a treat to be back at Regent. This is, uh, I don't need to tell you guys uh, what a singular institution this is. It's a really um, one of a kind place. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I've, my life has intersected with it. When I was a student, I was influenced by the faculty here through their writing and my life has intersected with Regent. At various points, it was fun with Bill uh, Reimer tonight trying to track the different moments in time when I've been here. So it's, uh, it's really a treat to come back. And I, I wanna say a big thank you to uh, Bill especially who cooks up the ideas for these things that make an excuse for me to come visit. So. And thanks to all of you for coming on a Friday night. Uh, um, I, I'm sorry your lives aren't more exciting, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I, will, I will reap the benefits of that. Tonight I wanna talk about how and why St. Augustine is our contemporary how this ancient figure uh, who uh, would seem to be separated from us by millennia uh, is nonetheless uh, somebody who could be walking alongside us today. And the way I wanna make that case is by trying to um, unearth and diagnose all the ways that we are philosophical heirs, even if we don't realize it. That, that is, we have all inhaled invisible philosophies in the cultural air that we breathe. Our everyday quests for authenticity and identity are grooves in the heart that have been laid down, I wanna show, by the ripple effects of an existentialism, a philosophical movement that maybe we've never heard of, but yet we have nonetheless been influenced by. In her wonderful introduction to 20th century philosophy called At the Existentialist Cafe, Sarah Bakewell pictures the melange of existentialists like Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Albert Camus, Martin Heidegger, Carl Jaspers, Gabriel Marcel. She pictures them all seated in a big, busy cafe of the mind, a Parisian one, of course, full of life and movement, noisy with talk, and thought. And she pictures the scene then that her entire book, which I really highly recommend to you at the Existentialist Cafe, after you buy On the Road with St. Augustine, uh, she pictures this scene that her entire book eavesdrops on. She puts it this way. When you peer through the windows, the first figures you see are the familiar ones, arguing as they puff their pipes and lean each toward each other, emphasizing their points. You hear clinking glasses and rattling cups. The waiters glide between the tables. In the largest group in front, a dumpy fellow, that's Sartre, and an elegant woman, de Beauvoir, in a turban are drinking with their younger friends. Towards the back, others sit at quieter tables. A few people are on the dance floor. Perhaps someone is writing in a private room upstairs. Voices are being raised in anger somewhere, but there's also a murmuring from lovers in the shadows. What are they talking about? Well, they're talking about freedom and authenticity. They're talking about being and nothingness. They're talking about consciousness and intentionality. And Sartre, even though he, dom he dominates the con conversation, though Beauvoir is the sharper mind, Camus is at times boisterous, at other times unsure of himself. This is a philosophy that is engaged and concrete, and one might even say erotic. There are cocktails and cigarettes in this philosophy. Hence my draw to contemporary French philosophy. <laughs> Can I say that at Regent? I can't remember if that's, okay. <laughs> but here's the scene I wanna paint. Amid the tables in the back, assiduously avoiding the dance floor, there is another African, a compatriot of the Algerian Albert Camus. He listens with interest, sometimes leaning in to grasp a finer point, sometimes grimacing at a conclusion. He's a silent patron of the cafe, and truth be told, a catalyst of the conversation, even if it's taken a turn that pains him. He recognizes himself in many of them, and in their conversation, he relives the frustration, the alienation, the burden of being free. Which is why, as the night winds down, Augustine quietly picks up the check before he slips out. So the conceit here is that, in fact, St. Augustine shows up exactly once on page one 
of Bakewell's history of 20th century existentialism and philosophy. As one of the progenitors of this existentialist philosophical movement that we're gonna dive into a little bit tonight. And in a way, what I'm trying to do is write the book that he deserves <laughs> instead of the one mention on page one. And I actually think it, this will partly explain the complexity of the secular age in which we find ourselves. So as I've suggested, we have all been schooled by invisible philosophies. Through a long trickle-down process, in fact, many of us and our neighbors have no idea how much we have all been influenced by a German book published in 1927 that 1% of people have heard of. Martin Heidegger's Being and Time, the title of the book, unleashed, in fact, some of the central concepts of existentialism that would then ripple into those French cafes and cinemas, eventually making their way to American universities and magazines and even Hollywood. It was from Heidegger, via Sartre and others, that we would learn to prize authenticity. Has anybody ever heard people talk about being authentic? Is anybody else sick of people talking about being authentic? The language of authenticity that comes so readily to our lips is a language of a philosophy that was in many ways sort of launched in 1927. And that we learn to prize authenticity and we seek to resist the flattening effect of mass society because of these ripple effects. The self, as Heidegger put it, uh, in the way, in a sense, the way he tried to diagnose it, the self, is embedded in a world, is heir to a history of possibilities that open up the world, if only, if only I could resist, as he puts it, falling prey to the idle talk of das Mann, the they. So this phrase, um, I was, uh, this sounded better until I said it on a Friday night. So let me, let me just pause for a second. So in, in Heidegger's, a uh, uh, sort of groundbreaking work, being in time. He, he gives us this diagnosis and analysis of the human condition that he sees as our being thrown into situations which give us possibilities that we could seize to realize who we are supposed to be. But what we have to do to become authentic is we have to resist conformity to mass society, the idle talk of what he calls das man, and the, the English translators often translate that as simply as the they. So you know when somebody says, they say you shouldn't wear white after Labor Day, right? Or so, like that, that vague they, it's like, oh, well, you don't want to do that. They, they say you shouldn't do that. Heidegger says, well, in fact, it's precisely when we fall prey to the they that we become inauthentic. And that's part of the diagnosis of our losing ourselves, if you will. So we too, Heidegger said, would learn to be resolute, to resolve to answer the call of being, to seize our inmost possibilities, to become the I that I'm destined to be. As Bakewell rightly notes, while later existentialists would frame this as the call to be yourself, for Heidegger, it's a call to take up a self that you didn't know you had. So this whole model and template of self-fashioning, finding oneself, discovering oneself, becoming oneself, is all language that's in the water of the culture, but it's inherited from this philosophical stream. Much of this was crammed in a nutshell in Heidegger's Being in Time, which then became this sort of ur text for everyone from Sartre to Walker Percy, from Ingmar Bergman to Terence Malick. Terence Malick spent the early part of his life before he was making movies translating the works of Martin Heidegger. Okay? Free footnote. So existentialism seeped into the post-war water and was disseminated not only in philosophy books, but film and art. Again, I think Bakewell captures the ubiquity of this invisible philosophy as really what we might call the philosophy of our secular age. Here's how she summarizes. Existential ideas and attitudes have embedded themselves so deeply into modern culture that we hardly think of them as existentialist at all. 
People, at least in relatively prosperous countries where more urgent needs don't intervene, talk about anxiety, dishonesty, the fear of commitment. They worry about being in bad faith, even if they don't use that term. They feel overwhelmed by the excess of consumer choice while also feeling less in control than ever. A vague longing for a more real way of living leads some people to, for example, sign up for weekend retreats in which their smartphones are taken away like toys from children so they can spend two days walking in the country landscape, reconnecting with each other and their forgotten selves. The unnamed object of desire in all of this is authenticity. So the DNA of this existentialist quest to find ourselves, to be authentic, is something that we inherit from this Heideggerian stream and trajectory. So now, here's the, here's the cool turning point of the story. It's 1995. I'm looking at some of you, and you're like just born, but anyway. It's 1995. Uh, I have, Deanna and I and two kids at that time, have left Stratford, Ontario on our way to Villanova University in Philadelphia for me to study my doctorate, for my doctorate in philosophy, and I went to work on Martin Heidegger, the works of the early Martin Heidegger. The same year that I went to Villanova University to study the young Heidegger, by the way, Villanova is an Augustinian Catholic university run by the Augustinian order. This will prove to be cool in a moment. The same year that I moved there, volume 60 of Heidegger's collected works, they're called the Gesamtos Gaba, which just sounds very philosophical. <laughs> volume 60 is published in Heidegger's collected works and it is a bombshell of a revelation. Why, how? Well, that volume, 60 provides the lecture notes of Heidegger's teaching from 1919 to 1923, which all turn out to be the backstory for that bombshell of a book that was published in 1927 called Being in Time, in which we've inherited all of our talk about authenticity, the quest for find ourselves, so on and so forth. The focus of those lectures from 1919 to 1923 was an introduction to the phenomenology of religion. All of the key concepts and categories that we would inherit as existentialist quests for authenticity, resolution, so on and so forth, all first show up in these introductory lectures on the phenomenology of religion. What were Augustine's texts? What was he commenting on? One course was on Paul's epistle to the Thessalonians. The second was on Augustine's confessions. So now, what you start to realize is the backstory of this entire existentialist quest to find ourselves, to pursue authenticity, to become who we are meant to be, it actually has an Augustinian legacy. It is from a direct confrontation with the Augustinian tradition. Augustine's also reading Pascal, uh, Kierkegaard, and others at the same time. And you start to realize oh, what we got in being in time are actually these kinds of formalized, sort of secularized concepts that first emerged in an encounter with Augustine's confessions. So for example, his notion of inauthenticity that's so central to his diagnosis of the malaise of our culture is actually generated in a chemical reaction of sorts when he's reading Augustine on what the fallen self looks like. Or what Heidegger will later call fallenness, our tendency to fall prey to the vague mass society of the they, is actually something that he learned from book 10 of Augustine's Confessions, where Augustine talks about being absorbed by the world and losing myself to the world. The aversion to inauthenticity that suffuses our cultural attitude is a trickle down now, you realize, not just from Heidegger, but from St. Augustine 1,500 years before. So, working through this freshly minted German text as a young doctoral student, it starts dawning on me. We are more Augustinian than we realize. We, by we, I mean those of us in late modern, late capitalist societies in the West. He has directly and indirectly shaped the way we understand our pursuits, this call to authenticity. In some ways, it's Augustine who put us on the road that we're on. 
And ironically, we show ourselves to be heirs of Augustine when we're maybe even most when we are trying to wriggle free of God in the quest for that freedom. It's why Augustine, I think, continues to fascinate. Uh, I, I did an event in uh, D.C. a couple weeks ago with Liz, Liz Brunig. Do any of you know Elizabeth Brunig, who writes a columnist for the uh, Washington Post? And she said, you know, one of the remarkable things about St. Augustine is, here's a guy from the late 300s and early 400s who still has haters. It's like, how, how relevant must you be if people like, still get really angry with you? Uh, the endurance of Augustine continues to fascinate. And I remember being struck several years ago when Mark Lilla was reviewing Robin Lane Fox's uh, then recent biography of Augustine. And he encapsulated what I think is the choice for us as we re-encounter Augustine and his legacy. Lilla put it this way. For a millennium, Augustine's portrait of himself served as a model for self-cultivation in Christian civilization. The imitation of Christ was the ideal, but those falling short could at least turn to the confessions to help get there. It was during the Renaissance that this conception of the self came under serious challenge, most powerfully in Montaigne's essays, which mocked the idea of sin and preached self-acceptance instead. So to Augustine's anxious admission that he was a problem to himself, Montaigne simply responded, what's the problem? Don't worry, be happy. And then Lilla's telling conclusion. As modern people, he says, we have chosen Montaigne over Augustine. We traded pious self-cultivation for undemanding self-esteem. But is love of self really enough to be happy? You know the answer to that, dear reader, and so did Augustine. That was in the New York Times, of all places. It's a very telling, what I would call a crack in the secular where somebody's like, hmm, what I would say is we've inherited Augustine's questions through that Heideggerian existentialist dream. Maybe our culture is reaching a point where we might even consider Augustine's answer. That's what we haven't done yet. So let me give you a concrete example of how and why I think this ancient African theologian, bishop, and philosopher has something to offer to 21st century North Americans. And the concrete example or case study is going to be this question. What does it mean to be free? What is freedom? What does it mean to be free? I think one of the reasons, the, the book is called On the Road with St. Augustine, and the first, I hope somebody recognizes that the first three words of the title are the title of another book, <laughs> On the Road by Kerouac, uh, which is also another very, very influential. Uh, uh, Mark Sayers from, from uh, Melbourne says, Kerouac's On the Road is the road trip that changed the world. One of the reasons we idolize the road is because we imagine it as the pinnacle of freedom. The highway is my way. Now, of course, if you think about it, the road is actually already somebody else's idea of where you should go. So the highway is not a blank slate. It's actually a network of channels that have been laid down where many others wore a path before. So the irony is that even when you're alone on the open road, you're following somebody. <laughs> so to answer the call of the asphalt is actually to follow them but I'm getting ahead of myself. Augustine reminds us how ancient the identification of freedom with leaving is. Uh, by the way, I created a soundtrack for um, the uh, On the Road to St. Augustine that's on Spotify, and the second song is by the Indigo Girls, and it's just called Leaving, and one of the great lines is, honey, all I know to do is leave. We identify freedom with leaving, so long before there were Shelby Mustangs and Route 66 and Rebels Without a Cause, the prodigal was itching for freedom from the scowl of his father and the scolding of his mother. If freedom is the absence of constraint, it will never be found at home. So when Augustine arrived in Carthage as a student, he had, um, sorry, I'm doing a lot of free footnotes here, but... Uh, just for those, I don't want to presume too much. For those of you who might not be familiar, St. Augustine, late 300s, early 400s after Christ, 
North Africa in what would be contemporary Algeria. Raised just off the coast, and at this time, remember, this is sort of late Roman Empire, and uh, um, Carthage is sort of the outpost. It's like little Rome on the African coast, okay? So when Augustine arrives in Carthage as a student, he anticipated in many ways a million fraternity and sorority rushes in the centuries that would follow. Unfettered, with room to get his elbows and various other appendages out, he swells to fill more space, chasing all kinds of new opportunities and delights. He falls in love with love, he recalls. I rushed headlong into love by which I was longing to be captured. It's funny, isn't it, how we can consider being captured freedom as long as we're the ones who choose it. Like every time I click agree and voluntarily give myself over to the whims of Google and Apple. So the young Augustine uses his newfound freedom to devote himself to these pursuits that will captivate him. He'll become voracious in his hungry quest for experience. He will be captivated by theatrical shows. He'll give himself over to entertainments that will enslave him to his own passions. He falls in love with love. Freedom in this picture is the right to be titillated, entertained, absorbed, all on one's own terms. Freedom is just freedom from. And the way to get from is to leave. This notion of freedom, I think, is basically the only notion of freedom we know in late modernity. Freedom as self-determination, the freedom to decide what is my own good. Freedom just means hands off, I've got this, I know what I want, I'll know I'm free when I get to decide what's good for me, where every choice is a blank check of opportunity and possibility. This is not unlike what Augustine thought freedom was when he made his way to Carthage and then later Rome. What he hadn't anticipated and what he tried to ignore even as he was experiencing it was the exhaustion of such so-called freedom. What he envisioned as freedom, which was the removal of constraints, actually starts to feel like its own sort of punishment. The obliteration of boundaries looked like liberation to the young Augustine, but he could feel himself dissolving in the resulting amorphousness. Think of it this way. When you're swimming in a tiny above ground pool at your cousin's house, and you're trying to do laps, in this little above ground pool, and you keep bumping up against the walls, you start wishing they weren't there. But then when, in your rambunctiousness, you actually succeed in knocking down those walls of that little pool, you realize the pool didn't get bigger, it disappeared. You're left in the soggy ruins. So then listen to Augustine's description of this experience. I was storm-tossed, he says, gushing out, running every which way, frothing into thin air in my filthy affairs. Can you hear this? Met the metaphor to hear is one of dissolution, dissolving, spilling out. The water is no longer in the glass, and therefore it's absorbed and lost. Freedom to be myself starts to feel like losing myself, dissolving, my own identity slipping between my fingers. What's emerging here isn't just an admission of failure, however. It's rather the problem of getting exactly what you want. This is why Augustine's story, I think, is so interesting. What, what is it that dissolves Augustine? It's not that he doesn't achieve what he's looking for. It's that he achieves everything that he's looking for. Those who have been eaten up by their own freedom, for whom the loss of guardrails only meant ending up in the ditch, start to wonder whether freedom, such freedom, is all it's cracked up to be, or whether freedom might be something other than the absence of constraint and the multiplication of options. Maybe, maybe there's just an entirely different way to conceive freedom. It is a terrible and terrifying thing to know what you want to be 
and then realize you are the only one standing in your way. To see the self you aspire to be on the other shore and you realize that you're the one who can't swim there. To want with every fiber of your soul to be someone different, to escape the you you've made of yourself, only to fall back into the self you hate over and over and over again. So after the thrill of independence and experiments and self-actualization, drinking your so-called potential for being to the dregs, when the exhaustion starts to set in and then eventually morphs into a kind of self-disgust, you can reach a point where you know you want a different life, but now you're enchained to the one you've made for yourself. That was the point that Augustine eventually reached. When he's glimpsed a different way of life, seeing the examples of peers who had chosen the way, who had relinquished power and privilege and success to follow the one humiliated on the cross, he finds these new desires bubbling up within him. He says, this is in the Confessions in Book 8, I, I sighed after such freedom, but was bound not by an iron imposed by anyone else, but by the iron of my own choice. He's back to feeling bound, hemmed in, constricted again. But now the culprit isn't his mother. It's not the man. The culprit, c'est moi. Augustine now sees that the freedom he chased was his own sort of chain in disguise. What he offers now, then, is a rereading of his own so-called freedom. So this is, I think, one of the most significant and crucial passages in Augustine's Confessions is, is about middle of book eight. Uh, it's around eight, five or so. And he, what you see is Augustine realizes and he starts asking himself, how is it that my freedom ended up becoming a prison? How did what I thought was leaving for freedom get me here in chains? And he uses this metaphor of a chain. Augustine identifies the links in the chain that read like a chronicle of the road that he's been on. Here's how he puts it. The consequence of a distorted will is passion. Servitude to passion, by servitude to passion, habit is formed. And habit to which there is no resistance becomes necessity. Let me, let me read, sorry, I, I don't do slides, so I'm just trying to be charming. Uh, um, so l listen, listen to, think of these as each links in a chain. The consequence of a distorted will is passion. By servitude to passion, habit is formed, and habit to which there is no resistance becomes necessity. By these links, as it were, connected one to another, a harsh bondage held me under restraint. The first link in the chain that binds him is what? His own free choice. The night I make that choice, I catch a taste for blood, as it were, a taste for flesh, and then the passion is primed in me to try again. Eventually, that satisfaction of the passion settles into the predictability of a habit, which is probably just about the time that it's actually no longer a pleasure. The honeymoon is over. The thrill has lost the sheen of novelty. One hit isn't enough. But by then, the habit has become a necessity. And what I want, what I want is pretty much a moot point. This is what I'll chase. This is what I need. Who's master here? Now, at first, it looks like Augustine's blaming somebody else. He says this, the enemy had a grip on my will and so made a chain for me to hold me prisoner. The devil made me do it. But that's only because, he says, I gave the enemy the key. I was responsible, he says, for the fact that habit had become so embattled against me. For it was with my consent that I came to the place in which I did not wish to be. What has Augustine realized? I am my own jailer at this point. What is Augustine describing here? He's describing the freedom of an addict. The habit, which becomes a necessity, the sighing after an impossible freedom, the longing for a new will, the despair of ever overcoming it. 
Indeed, he goes on to draw a picture of someone who can't get out of bed, and it sounds a lot like a hangover. So, so I've been told. <laughs> he says, the burden of the world weighed me down with a sweet drowsiness such as commonly occurs during sleep. He felt like those who would like to get up but are overcome by deep sleep and sink back again. He hates himself for doing it, but at the same time he says he's glad to take a bit longer. But then he realizes this isn't just laziness, it's a kind of involuntary paralysis. Like waking up in your body to find your limbs heavy and foreign and unresponsive. You can't even say what you want, even your screaming is eternal, internal, and you wonder if someone will find you and deliver you from the tomb that is your bed. This is what the fleet fo foxes call helplessness blues. I think to read Augustine in the 21st century is to gain a vantage point that actually makes all of the things that we call freedom sound a lot like addiction. When we only imagine freedom as negative freedom, freedom from constraint, hands off liberty to choose what I want, then our so-called freedom is actually more inclined to captivity. When freedom is mere voluntariness without further orientation or goals, then my choice is just another means by which I'm trying to look for satisfaction. But insofar as I keep trying to, uh, choosing to try to find that satisfaction in finite created things, whether it's sex or adoration or beauty or power, I'm going to be caught in a cycle where I'm both more and more disappointed and more and more dependent on those things. I keep choosing things with diminishing returns. And when that becomes habitual and eventually necessary, then what happens is I actually forfeit the ability to choose anymore. The thing has me now. In her remarkable book called The Recovering, novelist and essayist Leslie Jameson provides a remarkable insider account of both addiction and recovery as well as a, what you might call a curated anthology of how writers bore witness to their captivity. Addiction, she says, is always a story that's already been told because it inevitably repeats itself, because it grinds down ultimately for everyone to the same demolished and reductive and recycled core. It has three beats, desire, use, repeat. Desire, use, repeat. As a clinician later described it to her, addiction always ends up as a narrowing of repertoire. Your life contracts to a fixation on what you can't live without. And the rhythms of a day, a life, are engineered to secure this thing that never satisfied is never enough. The shame of this is that it has its own perverted delusions too. Addict pride in the genius it takes to satisfy an addiction. And what intrigues me here is, listen, I'm, I'm not, uh, um, what I'm saying is, in late modern capitalist cultures, this is a ubiquitous phenomenon. <laughs> it's not, oh, addicts really need to read Augustine. It's all of us really need to wake up to how much we've confused freedom with addiction. And here's the thing. You can't self-help your way out of this. Every addict who breaks free of this bondage comes to this realization. In fact, it's really remarkable. Jameson points out that the big book of AA, the sort of Bible of, of recovery, was initially called the way out. The way out. Out of what? Not just drinking, she says. It is the way out of the claustrophobic crawl space of the self. Coming to the end of oneself is the way out of disordered freedom. And so you get this irony. My freedom of choice brings me to the point where I need someone else to give me a will that is actually free. And not merely free to choose, right? Not just sheer power of choice. That's not enough because that's what got me here to start with. What I need is to be free to choose the good for which I am made empowered to actually become what I'm called to be. If freedom is going to be more than freedom from, if freedom is going to be now the power of freedom for, 
that I have to trade autonomy for a different kind of dependence. Coming to the end of myself is the realization that I'm dependent on someone other than me if I'm going to be truly free. That is unthinkable in modern conceptions of freedom because we've assumed that freedom just means independence, autonomy. But for Augustine, true freedom is actually being well-dependent, rightly depending. Jameson recalls her own epiphany in this regard. She says, I needed to believe in something stronger than my willpower. Her own willpower was inadequate to secure her liberation. My willpower, she says, was a fine-tuned machine, fierce and humming, and it had done plenty of things. It had gotten me straight A's, it had gotten my papers written, it had gotten me through cross-country training runs, but when I applied it to drinking, the only thing I felt was that I was turning my life into a small, joyless, clenched fist. The turning point of the recovering was coming to an end of herself. As she puts it, turning out and up to what the big book of AA calls it, the higher power. But what I'm telling you is, this is the Augustinian move, to turn out and up. A later reflection from Augustine is so poignant and encouraging here. It's one of my favorite lines Augustine ever uttered. The desire to, sorry, to desire the aid of grace is the beginning of grace. To desire the aid of grace is the beginning of grace. If you come to the end of yourself and wondered if there's help and are surprised to find yourself at times hoping for a grace from beyond, it's a sign that grace is already at work. So keep asking. You don't have to believe to ask. Here's the thing. You can ask for help believing too. Wanting help is its own nascent trust. The desire for grace is the first grace. Coming to the end of your self-sufficiency is the first revelation. This outward, upward turn is Augustinian. It's the posture of, now the paradox, a dependence that liberates, a reliance that releases. Once you've realized that you need someone, not me, once I realize I need someone, not me, you also start to look at constraint differently. What used to look like walls hemming you in start to look like scaffolding that were holding you together. If freedom used to look like the no obligation bliss of self-actualization, once that unfettered freedom has become its own bondage, you start to look at obligations as a restraint that gives you purpose a center, the rebar of identity. When Augustine looks back on his younger self, poured, pouring his soul into the sand and, and losing himself, he cries out, if only someone could have imposed restraint on my disorder, that would have transformed to good purpose the fleeting experiences of beauty in these lowest things and fixed limits to indulgence in their charms. Instead, he says, I in my misery seethed and followed the driving forces of my impulses, about abandoning you. I exceeded all bounds set by your law. See, for Augustine, without the gift of good, creaturely, creator-made guardrails, you're not more free, you are less self. You dissolve. You lose identity and substance. We might be surprised, I think, how many people are hoping someone will give them boundaries. This is why I am not a despairing person about the cultural moment in which we find ourselves, because I actually think we are reaching a kind of apotheosis of our cultural moment where people are realizing we have been trying out terrible ways of being human, and they don't work. And I think we might be surprised how many people are hoping somebody would give them boundaries, the gift of restraint, channeling their desires and thereby shoring up a sense of self. Indeed, there may be a generational dynamic to this where boomers whose revolution of negative freedom remade the world imagine younger generations want the same only to hear those young people actually asking for the gift of guardrails and the charity of boundaries. In other words, Graced freedom 
looks like following a path that someone has already blazed for you, realizing that on the road, you are always already following somebody. The question is who and where are they headed? In fact, what this deconstructs is the myth of authenticity bound up with negative freedom. On that story, I'm authentic if I'm sincere. And I'm only sincere if I act as if I'm making things up from scratch, expressing something inside me that's all my own. And that's exhausting. Augustine is turning that on its head. He's saying you do in order to be. So how do you practice your way into such freedom, depending on the grace of the God who loves you, tuning your heart, turning your heart out and up? Well, you join a community. You join the community of practice that is the body of Christ, lifting up your heart to the one who gave himself for us. You might be surprised to see how committing yourself to such a ritual, keeping such an obligation, actually translates into freedom and liberation. In uh, Greta Gerwig's moving film, Lady Bird, how many have seen Lady Bird? rest of you are dead to me, but. (laughs) Homework. You don't have to have seen it. But in Lady Bird, we meet a young woman who embodies the quest for freedom as escape. She is tired of the boring, backward backwaters of Sacramento. Sacramento. She's bristling at the nagging authority of her mother. She's embarrassed by her father's lack of ambition. And so the young heroine refuses even the name she was given, as if it were an imposition. Demanding to be called Lady Bird is just one of her acts of defiance, and she chomps at the bit to get away to college, anywhere but Sacramento. There's a scene in which a teacher asks, is that your given name, Lady Bird? To which she replies, I gave it to myself. It's given to me by me. And that's perfect, because in that version of freedom, freedom is actually receiving gifts from yourself. But at the end of the film, she comes home without leaving her college campus. She calls her parents, and she leaves a voicemail. Hi, Mom and Dad, it's me, Christine. It's the name you gave me. It's a good one. Ah, maybe the imposition was a gift after all. Maybe being named without your choosing is actually a sign that you're loved. She then speaks more directly to her mother. And as she does so, images of Sacramento bathed in golden light are accompanied by the plaintive soundtrack of Reconcile by John Bryan. Hey, Mom. Did you feel emotional the first time you drove in Sacramento? I did. And I wanted to tell you, but we weren't really talking when it happened. All those bends I've known my whole life and stores and the the whole thing. And now we see images of Christine driving around Sacramento, quietly awed and grateful for this place. And it's spliced with images of her mother doing the exact same thing. I wanted to tell you, she says, I love you. Thank you, I'm, thank you. It turns out the confines of Sacramento were the scaffolding that gave her an identity. It was her Catholic school that made her compassionate. It was the imposing love of her mother that gave her the confidence to be herself. Home made her free. Augustine found a father waiting for him after he ran away. He put it this way, you alone are always present even to those who have taken themselves far from you after traveling many rough paths and you gently wipe away their tears and they weep yet more and rejoice through their tears. Where was I when I was seeking for you? You were there before me, but I had departed from myself. 
I could not even find myself, much less you. Ah, but then it turns out, being free isn't about leaving. It's about being found. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Please do make your way to one of the mics if you have a question. Um, perhaps I'll get things started off. We were talking over supper tonight about it was just a group of us sitting around the table, and we came from so many different places. There's South African and a Welsh person and a Canadians, of, Canadians, a couple of Americans. We live maybe maybe more so than any other time in the world in a world of immigrants and emigrants. Yeah. We're we're always on the move. How does that play into this? We, we, we kind of naturally and physically are all displaced. So. Yes, yes. And, and um, so uh, there's, a, there's a, the, I think it's the third chapter in the book where I try to describe what I call Augustine's refugee spirituality. So Augustine thinks that the paradigm for the human condition and even the human heart that is already chasing God in Christ, that in fact that experience is less like a typical pilgrimage and is actually much more like the experience of being a refugee. In what sense? In the sense that the human heart is made to look for a home it's never been to. Hmm. Right? Think of that. There's a sense in which there's an exilic, uh, um, disruptive, disorienting situation that makes us feel not at home. Hmm. But the human heart is made to find its home in a country it's never been to. And in that sense, I think that this, Augustine's attentiveness to the difficulty of the Christian life, the, the um, upendedness of being, living between the already and the not yet, of, of straddling two kingdoms, two cities, um, he, he gets the vulnerability and the tentativeness and the, the fraughtness of that experience. And he says, um, listen, uh, salvation does not skyhook you out of that. It just gives you a compass mm -hmm. so that you know and are confident in the hope that you will reach the country for which you've been made. So yeah, I, I think to read that side of Augustine in our current cultural moment in which uh, um, not only is the world more mobile, but so many people experience displacement, all of a sudden these themes in Augustine, it's like you're reading with a new highlighter pen and you realize mm -hmm. things you haven't seen before. Yeah. Thank you. David, please. Thanks for such an engaging lecture. David Robinson is here, what? Great. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, I was struck by you mentioning Heidegger writing post-war, and of course the phenomenology lectures begin in 1919, I think you said, so yes. immediately post-war. Yes. And then the 20s are such a crushing economic situation for Germany. Um, so could you say a bit about the, the context of this post-war reality where Augustine becomes urgent, and what it's like to read Augustine as our contemporary now uh, post-economic crisis. I mean, it's 10 years ago now, but still feeling the effects of that to some extent. Yeah, I think maybe, maybe part of it is, that's a good question. I, I won't have a good answer for that off the top of my head, but I think maybe, maybe what we would identify is a similar kind of um, deep existential uneasiness where, where the illusions of our being in control and secure and safe have sort of uh, um, been seen through, right? We, we've, we've, the, the emperor's closed, nobody's fooled uh, anymore. And in a way, there's a sense, an experience of a kind of exposure and vulnerability um, that, that probably is part of what, a, what Heidegger is sort of spawning that, uh, and certainly part of what Augustine is diagnosing as just the human condition, and maybe we're primed to hear that and attentive to that in new ways right now, I think. I don't know, is that ballpark? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting question. It's a good one. Thank you. Please. Hello. Thanks for your coming tonight. Um, it's been too long since I read Confessions, and I just started reading yeah. a book. So if, if you've already answered the question, cool. Um, what I've read already and what you said tonight, um, can you say something about Augustine's uh, journey, struggle, conclusions, and some of what Solomon comes to in Ecclesiastes? Do you see any kind of parallels crossover there? Yes, so you're thinking of like in terms of the dynamics of vanity. Yeah, yeah. so the way, the way I think to read 
Augustine's own take on his story and then the human condition is that he thinks what happens is, so I want to dive into this for a sec because I think this is a really substantive part of, of his contribution. For Augustine, where we go wrong is when we are looking for love in all the wrong places. So we are made to love. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Where does the restlessness, the angst, the anxiety come from? It's precisely when the the heart tries to glom onto created finite reality as if it were infinite, right? So it's, it's not that the created things are bad, it's that we over expect from them. And so what happens is, is instead of the gift of creation being a window that then invites us to actually find our end in God, we seize upon some features of the creation instead of the creator. And, and for Augustine, and that's of course the dynamics of idolatry, but the diagnosis is that will never work. It's just, it's just an exercise in futility because now you've got what is an infinite hunger trying to find its satisfaction and you can't get no satisfaction, in finite things. But I I think it's really important to say, and and by what do we mean by finite things? Well, this is Augustine's itinerary. Oh, maybe education is the thing that's going to make me feel like I'm worth it, or who I am. Or sex is going to do that. Or power, or success, and ambition, and achievement. I mean, you can sort of run through all kinds of creaturely goods, and that's kind of his adventure. I just think it's really important to realize Augustine is not saying these things are bad. The question is, how do we relate to those things? So it's not God or the world. It's God, and then you get the world back again, in a way, as gift. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So that's the key. This is why disordered love, ordered and disordered loves, is kind of at the heart of what he's doing. Yeah. For your lecture, uh, you might have just answered this question, but I'll go anyway. Um, you mentioned that uh, in the Heidegger lectures uh, were based on Paul's writings and Augustine's, and it strikes me that a lot of what you've said is based in Paul, uh, particularly reminds me of kind of Romans 6, 7, 8, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 in sure. terms of addiction and freedom. So in what are the main and key ways that Augustine develops and expands on Pauline thought? Mm, so I'm a philosopher, so I don't really do the Bible, but... Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I'm going to answer a different question instead. No, I'll, let me work my way to it. So inter- interestingly, the part that Heidegger, why is, why is Heidegger reading First and Second Thessalonians? Eschatology, mm-hmm. right? In other words, what, he gets, what, what Heidegger gets out of uh, um, uh, the Thessalonian letters is actually this orientation to an end. What for Paul is being towards the coming of Christ becomes in Heidegger being towards death. So it's this futuralness. What Augustine uh, is particularly inherits from the Pauline, I think, is, um, well, so he's a Calvinist. Uh, so uh, that, that is, he, he has a deep sense of the kind of... Um, primacy and absolute necessity of grace for revivifying the human soul. And, and uh, in, in that sense, there, it's grace all the way down for Augustine. That's why he reacts so strongly, a little too strongly, to the Pelagians, for example, right, who think that we can sort of manage this, this ourselves. Interestingly, I think probably Heidegger, or, mm, Augustine's more significant biblical inheritance is the Psalms. So I don't mean he is. I mean, there's clearly a Pauline heart there. But I think what strikes me more than anything is how much the Psalms are basically his dictionary. Like that's, that's his lexicon is the language of the Psalms. And I think Augustine doesn't even know when he's quoting Psalms and not. You know, they come so naturally to him. And I think that's, Jason Biasi, who's at the Vancouver School of Theology, has done a lot of really important work on this, and I think that's a theme worth addressing. It'll also preach. Please. Hi, thank you for your lecture. Um, I guess I don't have a super, it's not quite, it's not quite a question, but... Um, if you just raise your voice at the yeah. end, then it's, it counts. Uh, yeah. that's a question, yeah. <laughs> so um, don't you think that? Not, I guess I'll just get to it. Um, not only, I would say it's not only Christians who 
kind of understand this human condition of this kind of thirst and desperation for boundaries. And then we see this manifesting in fascism and nationalism and these, these sorts of things. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I mean, I don't know if Jordan Peterson is a fascist, but I feel like his success is sort of the failure of the church where there's Absolutely. this tremendous thirst for something there. Yes. Um, so if you just have a comment about yeah. how that can manifest. So, yeah, th I don't know if you all understand, but I, I think that's right. You, another sort of symptomatic manifestation of where we are at in our cultural moment is actually how many different forms of belonging and dependence people are, are open to. Um, and I do think in, in the States, uh, uh, white nationalism, uh, especially for young white men, is clearly a form of their wanting to belong and be given an identity. Now, uh, and, and by the way, I do think Peterson's shtick is also answering people who are looking for, like, just tell me what to do. Be my daddy. Uh, this is why, this is, and, I, and I, I, this is exactly why I think people might be open to hearing an Augustine that they wouldn't have 25 years ago. Uh, however, this is also where I think part of the, uh, I never use this word, but I would say part of the apologetic burden then for making this argument is to try to show how and why it's not just belonging per se that will liberate you. In other words, not all forms of belonging and dependence will be liberating in that regard. And if you have to ask yourself what sort of belonging liberates in such a way that you also, it, it realizes the fullness of being human. And I would say here's one key criterion. It does not come at the expense of someone else's identity, right? In other words, so for Augustine, to find myself in Christ and to find my identity released and liberated by uh, the body of Christ is to actually be joining now a cruciform community whose calling is for the sake of the world and for love of neighbor. As opposed to other forms of belonging which are really just about securing our identity at the expense of your identity. That's, that seems to me one of the key distinguishing features of uh, um, ecclesial belonging, if you will. Uh, and, but I, I, I want to think more about that. Yeah. Please. Hi, I'm Jay, and I'm a huge fan. I really appreciate the work that you've done in making Charles Taylor more accessible and ah, great. adding context. Great, thank you. Uh, so I thank you for being here. My question is about what you were saying about coming to an end to oneself and yeah. opening up and out. Do you write about sort of like maybe like steps or even stages along that path? and maybe potential like pitfalls or obstacles and how to overcome them? Um, that sounds way too practical for me. And I wish I, wish I could do that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in some ways, um, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't know if that's quite addressed so concretely in this book, except that I do think Augustine is never imagining this as a lone ranger endeavor. So one of the key first moves one has to do is to give oneself over to the God who gives himself for us, is to also give but precisely oneself... that step. That step is... Are there... Is what that, does that like, look like? That's a journey. Yes. How do you yes. go through that journey? Yes. Yes. And then, you know, when you trip, yes. when you trip hundreds of times on the way, how do you get back? Yes. There's different ways to trip. Do you talk about how to get up? in those different ways of yes. shaping? Maybe, uh, and I, I, I don't want this to sound cliche, but maybe because one of the first concrete embodiments of that step is now giving myself over to a community and they will pick me up. They will believe for me. They will sing for me on those days where it's a question for me. And I think the communal dynamic of this is huge. I think, uh, um, you know, modern, Protestant evangelicalism so suckered us into imagining this sort of me and Jesus privatized kind of version. I think that is a terrible lie. And I think that Christianity is lived in community and which is exactly why grace, God's grace is always deeper and longer than my ability to believe it. Covenant, it's why covenant is so central. So that's, yeah, I think surrounding oneself, it's why, it's exactly why Recovery communities are such a remarkable echo of what God is trying to pull together in the people of God. I think. What about 
um, yeah, overcoming good. the resist good. ones the ego's resistance even to opening up to other people. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll just say this. Sometimes it will mean one has to go through crisis and the breakdown of the sufficiency of one's ego to get over the illusion that my ego is worth preserving. And that will not be a fun endeavor, but it will, you can see how it's actually a gateway to liberation in that regard. Yeah, I appreciate the line of questioning. Thank you. Please. Um, thank you so much. It's so inspiring and got me thinking a lot. Um, so my question is about um, like, just engaging this with non-believers yes. or people who are always going for freedom from, um, how would you um, help them understand the freedom for and even going further is that a lot of, well, people I know because I'm in social entrepreneurship circle and personal development circle, um, that uh, people are actually seeking the good things, right? So they are actually feeling fulfilled, in fact. Um, so I'm wondering how do we... Yeah help them to see also there could be, you know, the creator God who loves them, who called them and placed all these good things in them that is actually finite if it's without God. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think there's quite like a formula for it because I think it's very ad hoc and case by case. But I think there's a couple things that, that um, will be the case. One, I still think Paul's model in Acts chapter 17 of engagement with the Athenians, with the Greeks at Mars Hill at the Areopagus, notice that the stance of that engagement is not coming in, you idolaters. It's like you're immersed in all the altars and you say, I see that you are a very religious people. Which is a compliment. Like, that's true. Like, I mean, this isn't, this isn't feigning anything, right? You're actually meeting people and say, if, if I was an Augustinian doing this, I would say, I see you have a hungry heart. And I see you're chasing this, and you're chasing this, and you're chasing this. And I see, can we talk about what are you looking for and hoping for in this? And how's that working out for you? Right? And it's, so it's not, it's not like coming in. I don't think it's coming with an answer to a question. I think it's meeting them to ask if they are finding the food that satisfies the hungry heart. So it's a much more sort of on an existential register. I, by the way, I think it's equally important that the Christian also has to open herself up to, to the conversation and say, are there ways in which I'm not satisfied? Like be honest about the realism of this spiritual struggle. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is I do think it's just really crucial that the people of God learn how to be alongside our neighbors in such a way that you can meet them and welcome them maybe when, when the dissatisfaction sets in. I don't think you can argue somebody to an intellectual realization of the dissatisfaction. I think you have to just walk beside them when it happens. And sadly, that is often going to look like instances of crisis, but that's precisely when we can bear witness to what it looks like to hope otherwise, I think. Yeah. Please. Hi. Um, I also have a very practical question. Um, I'm a, a homeschooling mom. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I don't even know how to phrase this. I've been thinking. Okay. Yeah, I guess, like, because... I'm at home with my kids, yeah. um, and there and now, like I'm also educating them. Yes. There's like all of these philosophies of how we shape and yes. for form yes. children. And I've been teetering between these two philosophies. And your Augustinian talk about uh, really like the freedom to it, it comes from doing. Yep. I guess like. Yeah. How do you how do you teach this to your kids? Like, how do you give room yeah. for them to be? My free? kids are old and yeah. ruined. Okay, but, but yeah. how did you? How do you give them the freedom yeah. to express right. themselves? Oh, oh, while oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, their yeah. affections yeah. and not mean like overly. Yes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> totally. So I think I might even have two practical answers. The okay. first is. Curricularly, as a homeschool mom, I would say that there are pedagogies uh, 
that are especially reflected in some classical Christian education models that actually get at this, that the way that being precedes, that doing precedes being and knowing, and so inviting into rhythms and practices. The second thing about like one's own kids, I mean, I don't know how I would raise kids, I, I should check in with Deanna before I answer this question. Uh, I don't know how I would raise kids if I wasn't an Augustinian, because I don't know how else I would, um, let me put it this way. I, what would be terrifying to me is imagining that they are just putty in my hands and it's entirely up to me to stamp out the cookie cutter, which is a terrible, terrible way to actually get people who love God. Uh, it's a way to get moral conformity for a time. And what I would say is, I, I think we have been staked on this deep biblical uh, um, claim that God has made covenant promises, sealed our children in baptism, and that God plays a very long game. Oh, oh, this is, here's a practical. <laughs> the most important person for you to learn about is not Augustine. It's Monica, his mother. So there's a chapter on mothers in the book, and what you will see is in many ways, Monica is the hero of Augustine's story. And she prays like mad and weeps and chases him. She's like helicopter parent extraordinaire. Uh, but, she, but she also um, is entrusting him to God, not trusting her own parental program. And I think it's remarkable to see, you know, if you're a young person here today, I've been thinking a lot. You know, when Augustine was 30, he had no idea who he would be yet. Do you know what I mean? Like, if we could have met Augustine at 30, he is a completely different, he has no idea who he's yet to be. And, but Monica did. Monica had fervent hope, which isn't the same as optimism. She had hope in the grace of God. And I think to live into the model of Monica is an incredible grace. Um, and, and I hope the chapter on mothers gives, bears witness to that, yeah. Yeah, be encouraged. Thank you. God okay. plays long games. Friends, we have four people at the mics right now, so we're, I'm going to call a, you know, make a decision here. That's the final four. The fine, that's like the horses of the apocalypse. So, <laughs> the, so these are the four. If you have a question in your heart, <laughs> you can speak to the author um, afterwards at the book signing. Okay? It's so, All Saints Day, so you can just bring it right to Augustine, yeah, actually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll go there. Yeah, well, according to postmodernity, uh, Augustine's grasping at the disposition and finding coming to the end of his, um, to the self, that would be a, just another form of um, existentialism. It's another form of? Existentialism. So, uh, is he saying existentialism? Yeah, so I think Augustine is the first existentialist, but the difference is, for Augustine, there is a determinant way to be authentic. So it's not just me getting to decide what is authentic. It's actually me finding who I was made to be and answering a call that is not a call for myself. In existentialism, I'm authentic as long as I answer the call of being. But then when, when it turns out, when you ask Heidegger, well, who's calling in the call of being? I'm calling myself in the call. Of, it's this circular. For Augustine, it's actually answering the call of the one who made the human heart. So I do think, I, I'm totally fine with saying there's a lot of overlapping sensibilities with existentialism. It's just the answer to being human is fundamentally different. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Hi, yeah, thanks for that. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, I've been plugging my way through the book, and you deal a lot with Camus in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love Camus. Yeah. I got that sense. Um, <laughs> so, so do I. Um, but I mean, yeah, I, I'm interested um, in his rejection of grace in a sense, in his book, The Fall, where he seems to have a very real sense uh, that we need grace. And then second question, um, why doesn't Kierkegaard show up in the book? Good question. So the Camus piece, I, I think Camus knew exactly what he was rejecting when he rejected Christianity. And he says it's not even that he didn't think it was necessarily true. It's just that he couldn't accept it. And I mean, that gets right at the heart of, the, of 
grace is offensive to us. Grace is offensive. So I think, I think Camus, I, I also, I'm, no, I'm not going to say this. It's probably being taped. I, I, have, I have really high hopes for Camus' eternal future, but just because I love him so much. Um, so I, I do think Camus, Camus himself said he's an Augustinian without grace, which is, I think, taking, it actually takes Augustine very seriously. No Kierkegaard, um, mostly because there's not a ton of direct line of influence from Augustine to Kierkegaard. Or at least it doesn't sort of manifest in this philosophical conversation. Now, the existentialist stream is there. The more figure that probably should have showed up more would be Pascal. Blaise Pascal is kind of the progenitor of this whole project in some ways. Yeah, good question. Uh, so, um, firstly, as a graduate of Calvin College, philosophy hey! department, philosophy, uh, say hi to Dr. D. Young for me because she was my favorite teacher. It was what? Professor DeYoung, she was my favorite teacher. Okay, great, yeah, she's fantastic. Because you were never around. Yes, yeah, no, I know. <laughs> he was. Fair, he was. fair. Okay, so my question as the, uh, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse actually has something to do with death, which is... With? Death. Death, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, firstly, thanks for pointing out that Augustine was African. Thank yes. You for that. Uh, it's, so it's a significant sort of theme in the book. Excellent. Uh, so regarding death, um, we live in a world where currently it would seem the aim of maybe science, technology, is to maybe not so much to eradicate death, but to postpone it as much as possible with te technological advancement. What would maybe not Augustine say about the matter, because I don't think he will have envisioned a world like this, but what can we learn from Yeah. Augustine. No, this is, so the last chapter is death. And um, I think you can, I do think you can extrapolate from the sort of heart of Augustine's vision to imagine what an Augustinian response would be. He would see two things going on. One, it manifests how much modern culture actually is not able to embrace the frailty and fragility of being human. So, so, in other words, another way of putting it is Christianity is the true humanism because it also recognizes the fragility, dependence uh, 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 of being human. Secondly, what Augustine would see in all of those, you know, Silicon Valley attempts to sort of become immortal is a deep, he would call it Pelagian, right? That is, he would think this is an act of self-mastery as if we could save ourselves. He sees it as, a, as, a, as a, another form of imagining that we could save ourselves, which is then a refusal of grace, which is a, fuse, a refusal of our dependence on the creator. And, and I think he would then turn and say, and how's that working out for you? Do you know what I mean? Like I think he, it will spin itself out that, that mortality is going to be one of those sort of last frontiers in a way that people are gonna to have to grapple with. It's a, it, it, I'm so glad you asked the question. It's really a thread that I try to open up in the book, yeah. Um, thank you so much for a really powerful diagnosis of our, our current kind mm. of cultural condition. Mm. Um, the, Coming also out of phenomenology is the thought of John Paul II. And true. I'm hearing all sorts of echoes sure. of, of the, like the theology of the body and Absolutely. how, you know, and are, personalism. are made for self-giving instead of use. And can you just comment, please? Yeah, interesting. One, one small backstory to that is, so when I did my, uh, you know, one of the cool things in God's providence is I went to Villanova University to study Heidegger. I didn't know that God wanted me there to study Augustine. And so I land there with all these Augustinians who are both patristic scholars and philosophers. One of the uh, gentlemen on my committee was Jim, Jim McCartney, who had done his doctoral dissertation on uh, John Paul II's phenomenological background. So I'm sure part of that has seeped in. But I think exactly that uh, um, there's such a remarkable uh, thread of Catholic work in this phenomenological tradition, Edith Stein uh, um, uh, and others. And I think it embodies the personalism of that, but it also comes with this deeply other regarding picture. You also see that in the Jewish phenomenologists like Levinas, uh, but this sense that the human self is made for others and finds itself by giving oneself away, 
Uh, I, I think that's just an incredible picture. And by the way, I think it's a picture that John Paul II lived to the very end of his life. Talk about embracing mortality. I, I think the end of Mo John Paul II's life was an iconic uh, um, rendition of what it looks like to live in fragile dependence on God's grace to the very end. I think it's remarkable. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Friends, please join me in thanking you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.